Hey guys, uh, welcome to the very first episode uh, of Idle Talking with Nulty. Uh, it's the very first one of these we're going to do, so bear with us. Every man and their dog are doing podcasts these days, so we thought we might try our luck at it. <laughs> so we're going to have a lot of great guests on the show, uh, people I've known uh, for a very long time, and also uh, obviously people I've worked with within the industry as well. So I think it's going to be very exciting. We're going to uh, learn as we go, but it should be a bit of fun. Uh, please make welcome Mr. Tim Holland, the uh, the show producer. Say good day, Tim. Hi, mate. Great. This is going to be very interesting. We just spent an hour trying to work our our equipment, and uh, literally two minutes before this has began, uh, we got it to work. So the pre-show uh, organising went straight out the window. <laughs> yeah. Went out the window. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, we're here and we're working, and it's all good. We are now. Just to clarify. Uh, this, this podcast is called Idle Talking with Nolsey. It is not a uh, idle show podcast specifically. It's not affiliated with uh, Australian Idol or its TV network or its production company. Uh, obviously, the show is on at the moment, so we're going to have guests who have been on the show in the past, and we're actually going to talk about some of the episodes. But it is a Shannon Noel podcast, uh, not connected with the show. So, um, with that in mind, the first guest. Uh, is one of the legends of Idol, uh, you know. Uh, the the nas- He was originally promoted as the nasty judge um, back in the day, uh, but he's certainly not a nasty man at all. Um, Dicko has, uh, obviously before being on Australian Idol, was an accomplished uh, label executive, uh, in the UK, worked with uh, Simon Cowell and, and worked with acts like the Foo Fighters and Pearl Jam, uh, Westlife. Um, then came to Australia and, and, and ended up on Idol and ended up being a, a TV personality across uh, cooking shows and uh, dancing shows and uh, was on the, on the radio there for a while and is, is still doing a lot of, a lot of great things. So uh, welcome, Dicko. Hey! Hello there. I'm, I'm very happy. To be able to pop your podcast cherry <laughs> Exactly. Uh, I didn't think of it that way, but that's exactly what's about to happen. <laughs> Mate, I wouldn't have anybody else, but he also worked with Jumeiraquai too. I'd love to hear some stories about that sometime. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, well, some of them might be GA rated <laughs> as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, mate, and look, I can, look, can I just say to you guys... Um, I don't do many podcasts, but I've got one rule. You can ask me anything as long as I can answer it how I'd like to answer it. Absolutely. Well, absolutely. There's not enough limits, basically, boys. No, absolutely, no. mate. Well, no, we don't, we're not beholden to anyone, uh, as Tim was saying earlier. So uh, we can what, do whatever yeah. we want on here. So go for your life, brother. Cool. Okay. Right, Tim, yeah. where would you like to start, buddy? Well, I think the... The interesting question is obviously from the you you know you're from the UK, Dicko. How, how did you end up in Australia in the first place? Um, I, I was I, I ended up at BMG Records, which stands for Big Mean Germans. Um, <laughs> it was Bertelsmann Music Group, and uh, I was the vice president of international for UK and Europe. So I was looking after all of our acts around the world, and and I was um, I was kind of exploring a job overseas. One of which options was potentially going to America and that didn't really work out and um, was not mad keen on moving my little girls who are eight and ten to um, a big city because we lived in a village in in southeast England and it was a pretty idyllic existence and so I was kind of out the company I was ready to leave I was on gardening leave just um, which is where they pay you to do nothing and it was a great time of the great time in my life because the Rugby World Cup was on in Australia at the time. And I was just basically getting up in the morning, going to the pub, having breakfast, bacon and eggs, a pint of Guinness, and watching the World Rugby World Cup. It was fantastic. So, <laughs> And I did that for a, a – stayed at home doing nothing until the company said, look, we want to keep you. Would you go to Australia? And um, I said, yeah, actually, that would be really, really good. I'd been – I've been to Australia with Natalie Imbruglio, who was one of my acts, and uh, I really loved it. And uh, my wife said, yeah, let's give it a go. So uh, so we told our kids on my daughter Edie's eighth birthday, said, hey, so you've had a really nice day. She was high as a kite on red cordial. And we said, look, we've got another surprise for you for your birthday. And she went, what is it? What 
<laughs> we said we move into Australia, and both of their faces they looked horrified. And Edie said, "Thank you for ruining my birthday, and thank you for ruining my life." And slammed the door. And Esme, my oldest girl, she ran upstairs and was crying and screaming, and ran back downstairs with the Encyclopedia Britannica open on a page with a great white shark. And said, "Look, you're determined <laughs> to kill this family." So that was my that obviously that was my my plan all along to take him to Australia and get them eaten by sharks. So, <laughs> so no. yeah, we um we we I ended up moving to Australia. I knew the Australian company because I worked in international, and there was a like, guy called Ed St. John who was going to be my boss. Ed was one yeah, of good man. my great friends and one of the most lovely stand up, credible beautiful people in the music industry. Yep. And when I moved to Australia, um, BMG Australia, I have to say, hands down, was the best time I ever had in the record industry. It was just, there was just no blame culture. Every, we were kicking lots of goals and I made some fantastic friends there. And then um, a year and a half later, Idol turned up. But I have to say, BMG Australia was for me the archetypal Brilliant record company. And Shannon worked there. Yeah. Shannon knows those guys. They were fantastic. We eventually got swallowed up by Sony, yeah. which was a shame because there was such an absolute camaraderie and a, a feeling of supportiveness at being they're, just they're and that And that was due to a great group of people and some amazing leadership by yeah. Ed St. John. Yeah, I can't, I can't agree with that more, mate. I had an a, a absolutely fabulous time um, at BMG. We, we did really well. Uh, everything got done really well. Just everybody you worked with there was fantastic. Uh, and there was a bit of a hostile takeover during the time because we didn't know whether uh, BMG was going to take over Sony or Sony was going to take over BMG. And unfortunately, um, Sony... I think, to of, be honest, uh, Shannon, I think we all knew the way that was going to go. <laughs> yeah, I, I think... Uh, if you, I mean, obviously, Dennis Hanlon was uh, in charge of Sony at the time, and um, and they were a very powerful yeah, company. Yeah, and, they were. You know, were the number one market share company. And no matter yeah. how good we'd do, we 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 had during the years of was there, we had two points to what was a very small business. Yeah, and we had a fantastic time, but there was no way on earth we were gonna BMG was going to be the senior partner in any merger. Yeah. And I think that, that that's what ended up. Most people either left or, or went to Sony and then just pissed off, couldn't handle the culture there. And there was only a few OG members of BMG left at Sony at the end. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. There was only a couple a couple made it through the merger and, and then uh, the, the rest was <laughs> everyone else that you'd been so close with and worked with was sort of... Uh... Out the hey, door, Shan, but, yeah, mate. Shannon, you, you would have felt a cultural difference between oh, the two companies as well. Absolutely, mate. Uh, we, oh, we all felt, um, I felt like um, um, just obviously rented, you know what I mean? Like it was a sort of second rate. Yeah, we've got to take them because, you know, they're obviously, uh, at the time we were doing really, oh, I was doing pretty well with sales and that sort of thing as well. So they weren't going to, uh, to cut anyone really that they could make money out of, I suppose. But... It was really sad because uh, I just I never had a relationship with anyone really at Sony uh, like I like the the friendship and that that I'd had uh, at BMG and it really showed like um, there one stage I think we did it there was a a, con a convention and and um, like uh, I'd I'd had had three quarters of the album just about uh, recorded uh, written and recorded and um, we wanted to play lonely at it and they said oh no you're not we, until we've got a single. Um, until we've got a single, we're not gonna, we don't want you to play anything, you know. And then sort of one of the Soniacs got up and went, oh, we just, this is the first song we've written for the next album. And they, they got to play it. So, and it was, so I was just sort of going, oh, okay. So it was a bit of a, a real shame for me because it's sort of, um, we did have a really great thing going at BMG and everybody dug deep and, and got it rolled up their sleeves to do the very best job that they could. It wasn't about trying to climb the corporate ladder or everyone mm. knew what place they the right role they were in and, and what they're responsible for and, and did their very best to make it um, the, the, the best they could possibly do instead of just trying to um, move on to the next sort of uh, step in the ladder, which was a real shame. But anyway, you know, shit happens, I suppose, <laughs> with that sort yeah, of it, did, it, it felt like a family, though, didn't it? it did, absolutely, mate. Yeah, no, absolutely did, yeah. I, I, I really, um, yeah, it was really, really uh, um, saddened by, by how that went down. I think it, it sort of... 
It left a, a bit of a bad taste in everyone's mouth who, who had to who had to make who made it through the merger. You know what I mean? None of us that that sort of feeling and and friendship was sort of uh, was gone after that forever sort of thing, which was a real shame. But it's funny because there was definitely also a pretty tight knit team, Shannon at BMG yeah. as well. Wasn't that? Yeah, it's absolutely. not like there was there were a group of people who worked on Guy and there were people who group of people who worked on Shannon, and there was a little bit of friendly rivalry between yeah. the two. We got the shirts done, oh. remember? All the shirt, the Team Shannon shirts, they were, they were awesome. We had no Team Shannon written on all these shirts, and I, we eagerly passed them out around our marketing I remember, team. Yeah, I, I remember when we did, um, when we did uh, Drive, the video, we went to the Hay Plane yeah. um, to film uh, the Drive video, which was fantastic. But I remember being out on the Hay Plain, which is the flattest place on earth, and it was fucking hot. <laughs> and I, I had just never experienced anything like that. And there was Shannon, who was being filmed in this video, standing there, covered in flies, not twitching a bit. And there was me going, oh, I can't work out this fish out. Yeah. Finding whatever tiny bit of shade I could. And it was just like, oh, where on earth am I? Yeah. But it was funny because it was probably the first time I'd seen Shannon in his natural habitat. <laughs> his natural environment. <laughs> yeah, it was fantastic. That I remember some, oh, some great memories of that film clip. It was over three days, I think, and, and we just went hell for leather. We flew out of Bankstown Airport at about four or three, uh, six and five in the morning or something on these two, three little six-seater Cessnas or something. And one didn't make it back, remember? That was taken off. No, you wheel remember one actually crashed. <laughs> the wheel the fell off. It. On the, on the <laughs> runway. Yeah, and I... I yeah, we, did. we I, nearly went for Lisa Left Eye Lopez on that. <laughs> that's show. right, we did too. Because I, I remember too, they had... Uh, everyone was going like, is that your car in the film clip? And I'm going like, oh, mate, that car looked great on the outside, but it was the biggest bucket of, <laughs> bucket of crap. Because I was driving down the road and we're doing all these scenes where, where you know, flying down the road, right up, get, going around the truck and, and sort of... Uh, wrestling with the truck on the road, and then they uh, and you never take time off, as you could attest to this, Dicko, during a three day shoot. You just, you're hell for leather shooting every second that you can. And they said, Oh, you've got a couple of hours off. And I went, hey, Have I got a couple of hours off? And they said, Oh, they've got to fix the front end in that car before it falls out. And I went, I wish you'd tell me that two hours ago. I was just doing 170 down the road in it. <laughs> so Actually, you say you never have any time off, but I remember during that shoot, I did have. Have ridiculous haircuts from model. So I actually used to hairdresser on the drive shoes <laughs> to get rid of the Dicko mullet. Yes, that's right. And uh, it wasn't long after that the tour, uh, uh, probably around that time, a bit before that, the tour, uh, we were over in Perth and you, you just got your, your Australian citizenship came through and we all got the, the um, Southern Cross tatters. Oh, which side is it? This side here? Yep, we all got them yep. together, didn't we, mate? There we go. Oh, yep. <laughs> But I remember, Guy, I remember Guy was with us as well, and um, we went into a tattoo parlor on um, in Subiaco. Yeah. And um, and Guy, we were all having Southern Cross tattoos, and Guy said, uh, "Oh, um, <laughs> I, I might get my ears pierced, but I wonder what my mum would say if I got my ears pierced." And this big Maori tattoo artist said, "Son, if you got to worry about what your mum thinks, you're not ready." <laughs> uh, <laughs> and you wouldn't believe that now with all of his sleeves. Yeah. But, yeah, Guy was actually stressing about getting his ears Oh, pierced. no, it's so funny because it's really funny because Guy and I um, obviously didn't confer about tattoos, but we ended up both getting a phoenix, obviously from different tattoo artists. But uh, there's been a lot of conjecture around about who got it first and neither of us had a clue that the other one was getting it. We probably would have changed our, our mind if we did. But we've both got a uh, uh, what resembles a phoenix uh, a tattoo. Well, I was I was really proud of my tattoo, my, my Southern Cross tattoo, yeah. and then the Cronulla riots happened, so I had to <laughs> colour it in and put rainbows on it and everything. So look, I'm not a racist. <laughs> oh, that's a river, absolute river. That was a great. It's a, but, it was a great fun tour that one, actually. You, you know? Do you know what though? I've got to say the um, I said that that was the first time I'd seen Shannon in his natural habitat. That's not actually true. I went to Condobolin. The what about me? Mm. I, we, we were going to do an evening with Shannon. So I went out to Condo to see where this lad was from. Flew to Parks, hired a car, drove to, to Condo, stayed in the motel. And I managed to get him on the phone. I said, where are you, mate? He said, oh, just go to the pub on the corner and I'll come down. 
So I went there and I'm standing on the corner like a shag on a rock in the <laughs> middle of condo. All of a sudden I hear this, and that wasn't his voice. It was a motorbike. <laughs> and I heard this, I heard this motorbike coming down the road. And I look at him down there and he's doing a wheelie, a mono down the main street <laughs> in, in Condoville. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, mate. No, I did. I think I done one out uh, in uh, Miller Street in uh, North Sydney, out the front of BMG one time too. Yeah, and, and he didn't stop until he came and got to in some barbed wire and nearly. That's killed right. Near, I nearly ripped later. my leg off. Yeah, I was chasing chasing uh, ferals. <laughs> Dicko, what what was your first impression of Shannon when when he walked into uh, audition for that very first time? What was your first first thoughts about the young man? Um, well, when he opened his mouth and started speaking, I was thinking, is this closed captions as well? Because I couldn't understand a <laughs> fucking word he was saying. And, um, no, he, the, look, there was something about him. There was, um, there was some a stand up, honest quality to Shannon that, that was really appealing. And then when he explained, what had been happening and, and, and what had happened with the family farm and his father. And, and he was living with really young kids with Rosh down in Melbourne at the time because you auditioned in Melbourne, didn't nah, you? No, yeah, we were actually down there. Uh, Rosh's, it was Rosh's sister's wedding. And uh, we, yeah. had to, we, had, we were living still in Condo at the time. And we had to uh, go down there. Rosh had to go down for a <coughs> dress fitting. And, um, and her sister jumped on because she was always very supportive. She would heard us, my, my brother and I sing heaps and heaps. So she said, um, are you going on Idol? And I said, I don't know where the auditions are. And she said, they're, they're actually here in Melbourne next weekend. And I said, well, I can't. That's going to be hard because um, we forfeited twice in the local footy co- in, the, in our home, hometown <laughs> footy team. And if we forfeit again this weekend, we'll be kicked out of the comp. And my grandfather played for that team at the same club and so did my dad and my brothers as well. So... It was like we had 60 years' worth of um, investment in this sort of club from our family. And uh, my brother was actually coaching. And I rang him up and I said, look, because he also said you should go on this show. That uh, Have you seen the ads and that? And um, I rang him up and I said, mate, I've, I've found out where the, the auditions are on here in Melbourne next Saturday, on Saturday. And I said, but we, we, we're really struggling for numbers. And if I don't come back and play footy, we might, uh, we might forfeit. And he said, mate, bugger the footy. Just stay there and go to the auditions. As it turned out, you needed 15 to feel a side. Uh, we only turned up with 13. So if I'd have gone home, it would have been 14, so we still would have forfeited anyway. Oh, no. <laughs> Unreal. Well, look, did, did, did you know the weird thing about – obviously there was, a, there was a really emotive story surrounding Shannon, and there was, it, it was obvious that there was, a, there was some real melancholy going on mm. with regard to what had happened in fairly recent history with his father and the farm and everything. Um, but the other thing that was really interesting was that in that audition, if I'm right, that, that Shannon was using his sweet voice. That what did you? What voice? What song yeah, did absolutely. you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Hold me in your arms from from That's Southern right. Sons. Yeah. So so yeah. what what Shannon's classically known as now, which is this real afterburner, powerful voice. We we didn't really get a look at it in that initial audition. So it wasn't like if you like his signature. That, yeah. that got him through. All the stuff that people, I guess, associate with Shannon as an artist now, there was none of that. There was all that, all that was there was this stand up guy with, with an amazing story and a really pretty voice. But we always, people have worked with Shannon, and I think you'll understand this as well, Tim. People always see Shannon as this, this Barnsley afterburner voice, but I still maintain that his sweet voice. He's more agile than most artists I've ever worked with. Definitely. There's a, there's, he could almost be an R&B singer with that sweet voice. Yeah. It's, it's so pretty and wistful and communicative. And that's what we got in that first audition. Yeah. And I think I remember saying, I think Australia is going to love yeah. you. And I didn't really have a strong idea of the potency of the bush for Australian people. And, and I, became, I came to understand that, Australians have a misty-eyed view of of rural, the rural culture of yep. Australia. Yep. I think even people who've never, for three generations, have lived in cities, get a bit teary-eyed about the bushmen and yep. people working and living on the land and in regional Australia. So I didn't fully understand it at that point, but I had, a, I kind of had an instinct that there was something, there was an aura, there was a halo effect around Shannon and his story, regardless of his talent that was going to connect in some way. And obviously 
he did in no small part due to this man here, you know. Yeah, I mean, I'll tell you what, but I was absolutely crapping my pants go <laughs> when I was going up to see, uh, obviously, seeing in front of you three the first time because there were some amazing people. Because it was, I think there was 8,000 people or something in Melbourne, or 8,000 over the two days, and it got cut down yeah, to, to 100, and then the 100 came back on the Tuesday. So out of this hundred, I'm just sitting there going like, well, there's people warming up. And they came out and they said, you've got to sing a cappella. And I went, damn, I don't know the words of that one. <laughs> 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 so um, just watching these people that I'd heard warm. It's a bit like this podcast today. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But um, people coming out, uh, coming out from upstairs, seeing the judges, and they were just destroyed, you know. And I, I was listening to them warm up or sing in the room beforehand. I'm going, wow, that person can really sing. And then they'd come back with, you know, all teary-eyed and, and whatnot, and I thought, oh, this is going to be a massacre. But, uh, but, but yeah. do you know what? The funny thing is, though, Shan, it's fun- I, didn't re- I was really naive in Australian Idol yep. first series. I thought it's an A&R process and they're yep. going to film it. Yep. We, we're going to go and find an artist and they're going to film it. Yep. I was so unbelievably ill-equipped to do a TV show Yeah. because I didn't realise that it's all for television. I thought it... It, it's you know it's going to be what we do, yep. and we'll give them an insider's view. And it's you know as well as I, yep. it's not it's a television show. Yeah, absolutely. First yeah, and yeah, foremost. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And yeah. um, that's, that's interesting because I mean, I was saying most of the uh, you know contestants go on not knowing, you know, with that same thinking that you know this you know they're an artist and there's an opportunity, but as you say. It becomes a TV show, and you, of course, were kind of marketed as this nasty, you know, the nasty judge, so to speak. Were, were you comfortable with that? Um, I actually did a few. Um, I did a few screen tests for it before I decided to do it, and um, and and in one of the screen tests, I just let fly, and just whatever was in my head, I said, and I went home that night, and I felt really dirty. And the reason was is because in the record industry, we, we don't fucking tell the truth to anyone. You know, we lie to our artists, we lie to our managers, lie to the media, lie to the retailers. And most time, as you'll understand, Tim, we lie to our fucking selves. So I was not used to actually sitting in front of someone in the record industry and telling them the truth. Yeah. Because we're yeah. not built that way. So yeah. I felt really bad. So I said to the producers, look, I don't feel good, I'm not trying. So I went back and sugar-coated everything in a screen test, and it, it felt even worse. Yeah, It just felt even worse. So I just thought, do you know what? I need to man the fuck up and just do what they want of me, which is and, – and the way I was perceiving this was that they want the cold, hard commercial facts of the industry, and they want it from the industry insider. Yep. So whatever I would say about an artist behind closed door in the boardroom of the record company – I resolved that I would say that on the show with the cameras running. And there you go, the bastard was born. <laughs> hey, mate, hey, given this, this day and age now with social media, how do you think you would have handled, obviously, you know, uh, people's directing comments directly to you uh, um, on the way they do now with social media? You don't get away with much without having uh, a, a gazillion points of view uh, every time you open your phone up. Well, there's a few things at work in that. Question. Firstly, um, when, when I when I did my role on Idol, um, social media was in its infancy; it wasn't yeah. really in full swing. So, any reactions that I got was a lot of the kickings I received in the media or by the public. They were touching the old school, you know. Yeah, uh, you know, I might have got a serve from Alan Jones, and I yeah. think after Pauline comments, questions were asked in Parliament, and I go, "Oh, shit, <laughs> it's just not real." But, You've made but ultimately, it, yeah. it wasn't. But, but these days, obviously, I'd be hung, drawn and quartered and sent out to the city limits and dumped. Or even worse, cancelled. But the best yeah. thing about this is, like, try and cancel me. I'm not on social media yeah. and I haven't got yeah. a fucking show. Yeah. Oh. So do yeah. go for your life, guys. Cancel the fuck out of me. But I don't I, care. I, I, I honestly believe, though, what the feedback that I, I got from lots and lots of people during that time was you were saying things that people actually thought but, uh, but obviously didn't have the, have the kahunas to, to actually say it, you know what I mean? So a lot of people were going, well, he's pretty... I'm not saying about any specific, uh, specific comment. I'm just saying a lot of the time the general consensus was that, you know, I, I agree with Dick. And I think that's what 
um, warmed uh, you warmed people to you a little bit, you know, because you were just brutally honest, but you're but you're honest and you were saying things. But that said, but Shannon, do, do you not feel that there was an element of that show that part of the part of the attractive nature of Australian Idol one and two specifically was some form of ritual humiliation. Oh, I, I think it's still involved in it, to be honest, <laughs> a fair bit. There's still some people who go on it now that... Because uh, what, Shannon, what Shannon hasn't told you about the process he went through is that he would have turned up, he, do, he would have done an initial interview and an audition, they would have talked to him, and he'd have come back at least one more time before he came to us. Yeah, I sang in front of two different... I sang in front of some girl that she was younger than I was running around with a, 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 a radio... Things so that she was some executive somewhere, I think. But then uh, after I uh, sang two songs to her, then I sang in front of Greg Vanessa, the, the show's producer, and then uh, and then finally got then from there went in front of the in front of you three. And, and do you know what, Tim? That here's the thing. Here's the the fact of that process is what people don't realise is that that we have eight thousand people and they go through two or three auditions before they come to the judges and the cameras. And that whole process is designed to take the middle out. Yeah. Because there's a yeah, lot of people, the the bottom, a lot of people yeah. who can sing really well, but who gives a fuck? Yeah. Ultimately, you've got to be likeable, ambitious, and talented in that order. Yeah. And you've got to provide some good telly along the way. Absolutely. So there's a lot of people who turn up with great voices, but you go, yeah. So yeah. so yeah. what so when they took the middle out, what became what actually t- ended up in front of the judges? was the really good and the really bad. Yeah. And that's yep. what makes the television. Absolutely. Have you been uh, watching the new series, mate? Have you had a look at it? I actually haven't. I've heard it's I've heard it's okay, but yep. um but Monday night is Rory McElroy was winning the golf uh, in <laughs> Dubai. And then it's Happy Valley. Yeah. So which is one of my favorite shows. And I haven't got round to it. Yeah. And it's not like I won't. I will take a peek at some point. Yeah. But um but yeah, I haven't managed it at the moment. But everyone I've spoken to said it's okay. I don't know. Have you seen it? Yeah, yeah. I've I've watched the first uh, a first few shows. I think yeah, there's some once again some great talent. I think um, you know it'll be interesting once it gets down to the nitty gritty. You know, the top twenty or the top fifteen or or something like that. We start to get to know. You know, I was a security guard until the the, the top six or something. <laughs> Who's that guy at the back? Is he's not a contestant? No, he's a security guard. Someone said. But I think we'll get to. I think they will. They will find some great talent in there. Some, some a couple of girls have got some really nice voices in there. But it's like you said, I, at the I moment, think, it's that. It's that. You know, the the bottom of the. You know, the people just going on there for a, some. Cause some people go on there for a laugh too. You know what I mean? Like they're going on there just to get their head on telly yeah. and have a bit of fun, which you know, which is great. It adds to the you know the value of the show, the comedic value of the show. Yeah, look, I mean, there was some there was some amazing moments in those those early auditions. Some really incredible talent where you go wow that's amazing mm. but just some absolute deluded nut jobs you just can't <laughs> and, and the thing that used to thing that used to bother me is in those days nobody knew who i was and we, we we'd do these auditions in public spaces like either hotels or or stadiums or some sort of convention center and if i wanted to go for a leak i'd get up unplug my mic i'd have to walk through the foyer through all the contestants and and go to the loo, and and more often than not, there'd be people pointing to me, go, "There's the bastard that said that to me," <laughs> and I'd get followed by the family, and oh, I'd go, no. and they go, "You don't know what you're listening for." And eventually, he got me, gave me the shit. You'd see this this posse of deluded people <laughs> saying, "You didn't give her a chance," and I'd go, "Hold on, I can absolutely accept that she's tone deaf." But you all can't be fucking tone deaf. <laughs> Some of you must be lying you to may, Yeah, that's the biggest thing. You made so many people are tone that's deaf. Okay. I always thought that too, going like, you know, surely somebody's let them know. Because a lot of these people, your heart breaks from because they, they really, really believe that, um, that, you know, that, and then they do the big, oh, I'm going to make you sorry you said that and all this. And it just sort of mm. adds, uh, you know. Oh, you know what I shared? You, you, I was at Tamworth. I missed you, I'm afraid. I'd love to have seen you yeah. and Blake. Uh, yeah. Busking together. Yeah, yeah, it was a bit of fun. Mel sent it to me. Mel said, "Shannon's Shannon." Mel sent me a clip saying, "Look, Shannon's busking with Blake," and I went, "Oh, I've got to get into town." And yeah. then, but um, oh, it's a shame. It's great, been great to see you. But do you know what? I had so many people turning up, poking me in the ribs at Tamworth, saying, 
you rejected me on Idol. <laughs> and I went, well, I said, you're not Robinson Crusoe there. Yeah. But so there was like, but Kirsty Lee Akers said that, Adam Eckersley said that, and I'm going, <laughs> Oh, I tell you what's funny. I, I ran into uh, Casey Barnes the other day at uh, in Tamworth, and he said last year at the Golden Guitars, something about they you didn't have the right accreditation, so they wouldn't let you into the after party. And he said, and I walked straight in and went, "How's it feel now, Dick?" <laughs> he wanted to get. He wanted because I think he was on our year, wasn't he? He wasn't on your year. He was on. Um, I think he was on the year that James Johnson was on. James right. Johnson. Yeah. Came- James Johnson came third, and and Casey, believe it or not, was the first of the twelve to be voted off. Yeah, right. Yep, yep, yep. So he was. So so, and um, but look, you know what? Some people take a while to to cook. Oh, absolutely. And, but and yeah. I think both of them are doing oh, amazing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, Casey's just won an Aria and two Golden guitars. Yeah. And 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 James Johnson and his manager have really torn up the rule books last year. Yeah, absolutely. In terms of Australian country. So 100%. you've got to say, you know, mm. both of them have done an amazing job and have found their found their partners and their and their and their yep. colleagues and have done a brilliant job. But I had people come up to me, Adam, do you remember Michelle Cashman? Yeah, the name rings it. I know the name. Yeah, she was in yeah. Idol One. She came up mm. to me and said, Hi, it's Michelle Cashman. And there's Hayley Jensen. There's a yeah. lot of people. Who yep. were on Idol? Yeah, who are, oh. who are out there doing the stuff now. Absolutely. You know? Oh, mate, that's the thing. I think you know, it's a, it's a massive, massive uh, learning curve and a massive opportunity to get to get a great heap of really, really great uh, experience. You know what I mean? Being put in that situation um, and being put on the spot and and really, really, you know, being so vulnerable, um, like singing a cappello and, and and in front of you know three you know heavyweights of the music industry and not let alone the cameras in your face and and all that sort of thing. So. I think, you know, from the experience you take from that, I think, you know, it definitely stands stands by you uh, down the track, you know what I mean? So I just thought everyone out there who's uh, thinking about auditioning, it's not the end of the world if you uh, if you yeah. don't make it through. But um, yeah, yeah, do you know what, I, Shan, do you know what I used to say to people um, quite often was, I'm not saying that you couldn't make money out of your voice. Yep. I'm just saying that I can't make money out of your that's voice. That's right, absolutely. And yeah. that's the difference. It's like yep. whether not everyone needs to be... Or, or can be a big commercial artist. Yeah. And that's not to say they haven't got a really wonderful voice. Yeah. But if there's more to it than that, you've got to be likable. You've got to have a connectability. It's a TV show. <laughs> yeah. But but beyond yeah. that, you know yourself, you've 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 got to be able to connect yeah. with an audience yeah. on on a number of different levels. Yeah. And even you and I morphed you, the way you've connected with the Australian public has changed and evolved over the past 20 years, hasn't absolutely. it? Oh, absolutely, mate. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I think if you're not growing and evolving the whole time and trying to better yourself in different ways, then, you know, you're, you're sort of, um, well, you obviously know everything to <laughs> already. So you've always got to be taking things on the chin, look for the positive in it, and then try and use that down the track to add, you know, put more uh, more arrows in your... in your Quiver. Quiver, yeah. that's it. <laughs> Dicko, you, you spoke before about how there was, you know, the really good people, the people in the middle and and the really terrible people. How did you feel? Well, obviously, you know, the the TV producers would would go through that earlier process you talked about and they, they would find these horrendous people who had absolutely no talent at all and they would feed them to the lions, so to speak, you. And, and you would, you know, tell them they were horrendous were you comfortable doing that and and i guess the second part of this question is should we be doing that and should show now now that we know more about you know mental health and the impacts of these things is that a healthy thing to be doing you know on tv yes and no Uh, i think um i is it is it the is it right to humiliate people for the edification of prime time TV viewers, probably not. But um, but that said, it's at some point you some of these people turn up in front of the cameras, and you get this thing, the distinct feeling that it's the first ever brush with reality they've ever had. Yeah, it's the first time that anyone said to them, "Actually, you're not that fucking good." <laughs> in fact. You're rubbish. Yeah, in fact, you know what? You you're not even the same in the same postal district as that melody or key. 
you know. Yeah. And 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 then there's other people who just 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 a little bit off. And uh, look, I, I guess in my in my mind, and I'm probably kidding myself here. In my mind, I only ever killed to eat. I didn't kill for fun. Yeah, absolutely. That's yeah. probably not true. I would say it, that's probably something I say to make myself sleep a little better. The fact is that, that I am a piss taker. I come from a family of piss takers. And in my family, my extended family, if you couldn't roll with the punches and take one on the chin, you didn't survive. Yep. So I think naturally, if I see someone who displays a little bit of a flaw, my natural instinct is to take the piss. Mm -hmm. And and I'll try not to be super cruel. I'll try to do it while I'm putting my arm around someone. But it was another technique that my family used to make sure that people didn't get too big for their boots. Yeah, Everyone yeah. got fucking slammed in my family. Yeah, And so I, I think that's what... So I would see an opportunity to go someone, and I generally... I generally would go them. Now, the second part of your question, is it right and 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 should we worry about mental health? Um, th there is an element to that. It, that was something that we did think of. However, and this is probably not going to be terribly PC to say this, but it's I'm 59, I'm turning 60 this year. I I think it's really good that people can talk about their feelings. However, I think there's a whole generation evolving that are overusing the term mental health for maybe thing, maybe to get, as a get out of jail card. I think everyone yes. should be able to, I think everybody should be able to discuss how they feel and to have a willing pair of ears to, 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 and a heart and a mind to, to confide in, to open up about how they feel. That's a positive thing. And certainly where Shannon's from in the country, a lot of stoic farmers have taken their lives purely and simply because they're unable to yeah. communicate how they feel. So don't get me wrong, I'm not a Luddite. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not dumb about how important mental health is. But it's become a buzzword that people, I think, use as a jet out, get out of jail card. And if you're telling me that we shouldn't have singing competitions because we might worry that people might get yeah. their feelings hurt, then sorry, don't fucking turn up. Yeah, don't absolutely. go because no one's no one's holding a gun to your head no. to turn up and be judged by industry professionals. If you are that fragile, hey, don't go. Yeah, I really, agree. Yeah. Don't, I agree. Don't, I agree. Don't go because it's not you. Yeah, no, I agree, mate. Sorry, I, think, I lost that last bit there, but yeah, absolutely, mate. I, I think so too. So, mate, would you have you got any advice for the, the this season's judges? Um, and have you asked to be involved at all uh, for the new series? Or yeah, I mean, I've, I've sent her that fifteen begging letters. Of course, I didn't <laughs> fucking ask to be involved. No, did you get <laughs> asked? Did you get asked? No, I didn't get asked. Look, bizarrely, no, no one finds this harder to believe than me, but. You know, um, in the number one youth format of the last 20 years, when Channel 7 picked it up, they didn't actually ask for two confused 70-year-olds and a bitter and twisted six-year-old to drive their judging panel. So, look, well, um, the car's gone soft, they're saying, this year. Do, do, you, know what I, do you know what I reckon, though? Um, I, I think... Um, I, th I don't think I'll be able to do it anymore. I, th I don't think I'd be able to be myself. Yeah. I don't think I'd be able to say what I meant um, for all the reasons that you just said, Tim. Um, and and here's the worst thing, and this is this is to do with all television, but especially Australian Idol, as I learnt it to be at the end, is I am no longer prepared to pretend. No, absolutely. So yeah. it's like I've I've been off the television for quite some time now. And I'm really enjoying working in music, especially surprised to find myself enjoying working in country music so much. Mm. I absolutely love it, and I'm learning so much. But I'm, what I'm not prepared to do is to go on TV and pretend that this is the most important moment in someone's life. Yeah. And to pretend that this is bigger than anything that's ever faced you. It's bullshit. It's yeah. like, you know, who? we all know that's not true. 
But it's like, you know, they, they, if you want it to make the 30 second promo to get people to watch, That's we've right. all got to yeah. suspend belief and pretend. Yeah. And I don't need to pretend because I'm working in music now and it's, I'm near the coal face. And yeah. I go, well, I don't need that fix anymore, you know? Yeah, mate, so, I, it's something that I've always, I've, ever since, you know, watching the, show, the, the following seasons, every season was, oh, it's the best season we've ever had on the show. Uh, and every t- what the biggest one, one for me though was uh, the constant. Oh, you're going to be the next Australian or world, uh, worldwide superstar and all that. And I'm just going, oh my God, you can't. Like these kids have no idea what they, what's coming because they believe it and they believe it, you know. And I just think mm. it's totally, you know, unnecessary to do that. At least if the very least, if they put, and there's going to be a great heap of hard work to be done and all that. To, if you're ever going to get there, they never say that, but they they more or less say you're going to be. So big and so so massive, you know, and, and uh, such a, a huge star. And I just go off oh, crying out loud. Let them. But to be fair, though, Shan, we did create some artists, and and, oh, and yeah. we were fortunate. I mean, imagine, imagine having artists. Imagine, can you possibly imagine anyone coming out of Idol this year and releasing a song as good as Lift? Yeah. Or yeah. Shine. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, and hope they, like, I hope they do. I hope, I, you know, because oh, you know, after all this time, there's no, there's, there's no stars being made many uh, on any of the other shows um, that I've seen. You know, you see them for five minutes and then they're sort of gone. But there's very rarely uh, anyone who's carrying on with a career. But the point I'm making is, you didn't, you, you didn't come out of Idol with Lift and Shine. No, no, absolutely. You came out of Idol, and what, we, the door was open for you, and you walked through that door. Absolutely, yeah. We're yeah. pretty okay. I've got a taste for this. Yeah. I'm not going to let this go. This is what I'm going to do. This yeah. is what I want to do. I can see these people are good. I'm going to turn up every day and and give a shit about my career yeah. and take responsibility for it. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Yeah, I agree, mate. Absolutely. Um, back on what we were saying before. So, what what um, are you up to these days, mate? You, you said you've been doing a little bit in, in country music. Uh, give us a bit of an idea. Well, what's it I, I moved. I left when when I realised that. I'd finally been found out and the phone was going to bring Candy Ball <laughs> for TV and radio. Um, when I realised that that 15-year lucrative scam had come to an end. Oh, you did great. Um, you did great. Sam. I, um, I, uh, me and Mel decided to... Also, the kids had left home. We lived in a big house in, in Sydney and we were rattling around in there and me and Mel went, well, let's move somewhere where the kids will never move back in with us. So we found a small <laughs> country town in regional Queensland. Awesome. And it's a and, um, We just lost and, that last and, yeah, week. And I, I didn't know what I was going to do. I said, we live in a beautiful part of the world. You've been up here with the family. Yeah, it's gorgeous. It is really absolutely attractive. beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. But I didn't know what I was going to do, Shannon, because um, I, I'll be honest with you, the most... The biggest shame that I felt was was not being famous anymore. Not and and all that stuff that I'd wrapped up in this Dico brand was no longer wanted or attractive. Yeah. And I felt like a junkie. I felt like a fame junkie. And I didn't know yep. what I was going to do or whether the phone was ever going to ring again. And and so I I just thought I don't know. And and I, I by accident I kind of fell back into music and. And I always promised myself I'd never be an artist manager because in the record industry, we look, always looked at artist managers and thought, now that is the worst fucking job yeah. on the planet. Because And I, and I saw my, my old boss, Richard Griffiths, who used to be the chairman of BMG UK, he ended up managing One Direction. And I met Richard when he was managing One Direction in Sydney and I went, so what's it like, boss? He went, it's fucking worse than you'd ever imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Why? He went, well, it's like we suspected, it's providing the unnecessary to the ungrateful. Yeah, and right. um, and I went, yeah. And then I realized, then I got a real crisis of confidence and rang my manager up and went, was I this bigger nightmare? And he went, oh, you've no idea, darling. You're even worse than these. <laughs> so, so I felt really guilty for how I treated him over the past 15 years. Yeah. And, um, but no, I, once I got into it I, and realized where the bullshit was and, and what you need from an artist. You know, and I'll say that again. You need likability, uh, ambition, talent in that order. Yep. And that's what I judge my artist by. And then, and, then, and, and then I really enjoyed it. And then by accident, 
And I started working with an artist called Taylor Moss, who's a girl from Noosa. And she'd been around the country world for quite some time, but had never really quite made it stick. Mm -hmm. And um, and she was singing on a show we were doing called Dicko's Country Spit Roast, which was like country classics, drag queens, and hey, hey, Saturday gags. And it was fun. Yeah. And she was, our, she was our principal female. And her voice was insanely good. And all, from all those idol auditions, I, I knew what a good voice was. And she was really hungry and just had a good sense of humour. And we all fell in love with her. And yeah. she said, look, would you work with me? And so we listened to her songs and then she started releasing and then we started managing her. And, and, and yeah, things started to happen. And then two years later, and like number one song, like five million streams, and she's going great guns. She just got nominated uh, for a golden guitar uh, yeah. for best newcomer. And and I really believe in this girl. She's um, she's 27, and for the last 10 years, she's like she's she. At age 17, she was out of house, driving herself to Tamworth from Noosa to sleep in a car just to be around the action. Yeah. And she's been doing this. She just she's been hanging around the periphery for the last 10 years. So it was so proud. I felt like a proud dad walking the red carpet with her last yeah. week. Tamworth, where she'd been acknowledged and nominated, and it's like she's got a seat at the top table at long last, and she's been respected and taken seriously, and that makes my heart sing, and I feel so thrilled to be working with her, really. And and look, and I'll be honest, you know, I've looked at what Tim's been doing because every, when I first got into music, everybody told me about Tim as, and what he represented to the Australian country scene. And because I said, when I got in, I said, who are the good guys? Who are the people who are doing this really well? And they were pointing to Tim and said, he's really, really good. He's super connected. He's got great instincts. So I basically started looking at who he was working with. Rachel, for him, was someone I got in my sights. And I went, okay, I've got this girl, Taylor. What's he doing with Rachel for right. him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, so yeah. successful. Yeah. And, it, and, and, and it was that simple. I started stalking Tim, even though he doesn't know this, <laughs> and finding out what he was doing with these artists and how it was working and, and just started emulating the successful habits of him, really. And, the, and so far, it's been successful. And now I'm finding my feet a little bit more and feeling a bit more confident about trying some different things that maybe my own instincts are taking. And, yep. and yeah, look, who knows? I mean, everybody wants to be big in Nashville, but my view is you've got to be a big fish here, really. You've got to have a yeah. compelling yeah. story in a Australian country. Uh, so that's what I'm doing in country, and I'm loving it. I'm working with an artist called Matt Cornell, who's, who's really super likable. Yeah, and Matt just got a great... Matt, Matt played bass for me for years. Is of course. Guy, yeah, right? I know. And and we talk about you all the time. <laughs> I bet. Nothing good, I bet. <laughs> no, of course. It's it's legendary. I mean, look, you know what? Everyone, you know, he, he loves the time that he spent with you yeah. because I think, obviously, he's suffering from post-traumatic stress syndrome, <laughs> but, um, as most people are. But that's part and parcel of it. That's you know, right, you yeah. are a hurricane and you're very hard <laughs> to keep up with. You know? Yeah, oh, well, I'm slowing down these days, mate. Don't worry about that. But I think um, going back to what you're talking about management, being in that development process, I think, is a very, very uh, different thing to, to just taking on a big act that's already established. I think I could really see um, you really enjoying, you know, because you can see the fruits of your labour, you can see the, the, the hard work you're putting in and you can guide a young artist to make the right decisions and go down the right track, you know, and I think I could see you being really rewarded by that, and I think that's probably the best, uh, a great spot for you to be in um, as a manager, mate, I think, is uh, the wealth of knowledge that you have and also, you know, the experience, international and, and you know, at, at the very, very pinnacle of the industry itself, with inter working with international superstars, you know, there, if there's something out there that... Uh, that you wouldn't know, I'd be pretty surprised, I think. So I'm, I'm really happy oh, for you. Mate, listen, do you know what, Sean? It's nice of you to say that, but it's John Watson famously said, the manager has to get used to being the dumbest person in the meeting. And that's the thing. I think the difference is right now, because I'm old, I have no shame in saying I don't know. Yeah. And that's the difference. I think 20 years ago, I would have felt really shame-faced to admit that I was a dumb 
And now yeah. I'm, I'm absolutely happy with that. Yeah, and I've been yeah. saying it for years, mate. It's not that bad. <laughs> and it's okay because it's impossible to know. If, every, if, if we all knew everything, then we'd all be billionaires. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's actually a very difficult business. It's made, made for everyone to fail. I'm keen to ask you, Shannon, about yeah. country music in Australia. Uh, you've always had that element to you. Most mm. of your success has come with with pop songs, basically. Yeah. You know, as I said, like Lift and Shine, amazing songs. I mean, you've got a whole raft of the other amazing ones, but I still think Lift yeah. is one of the best Australian pop songs ever. Yeah, but thanks, it, but but are you? Uh, do you feel you belong? in the country Australian scene. You had you headlined a park show at Tamworth last week in front yep. of thousands of people. Yeah. Do you feel like you belong? Do you feel like you're accepted? Um, no, I don't think so much accepted in the country market, mate. I, I, I once went to the, the Golden Guitars. They asked me to invite me down to present uh, an award. Um, and I was walking down the red carpet and somebody said, these are the country music awards. The journalist said this, these are the country music awards. What are you doing here? And I said, well, I guarantee you one thing, I can cheer more fucking cheap than anybody else is going to walk down this red carpet <laughs> <laughs> for the whole day. So um, so I, it's a little bit of a, I think it's, there's a bit of a gentleman, oh, an old boys club a little bit in the country market. There has been for a long time. And if you don't come through that, you know, that the sort of Tamworth, um, you know, um, star search, star finder thing, uh, you, and you come across from, from pop or... or or you know, or rock, rock, pop sort of stuff. It is a little bit difficult to to break into it properly. I think the festival side of things is a different kettle of fish because obviously, if you can drag, if you can pull numbers, then then you're you're well, you're you're in the mix there with that. Which which I'm I've been very lucky to be able to be considered in that in that realm a little bit. But I think um, yeah, it's just getting better and better. You look at the American market, it, uh, the country market in America's. Far outweighs nearly every market, every other market, pop and, and the rest of it. You know, I think so. Mm. It's uh, we we're producing some great acts here in Australia who are writing some great, great, great songs too. And I think we're the sound of Australian country is going down that 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 American style a little bit, where you could put different instruments on it. It could be a rock song, it could be a pop song, but it's it's that much more energised sort of uh, material coming out. Um, the days of um, you know pub with no beer sort of thing was very, very celebrated and as it should be uh, in the past. But I think that sort of... People don't want to be that sort of uh, artist too much anymore. They, they, they'd they like to, to wear the, you know, the baseball caps and things like that and, and have, have mm. a rock and a bit of a rocking set. So as much as the, the, the industry seemed to be coming together is stylistically, you know what I mean? I think um, uh, it's still a little bit difficult to be considered in that, in that area, you know. But I'm, I'm sort of a little bit doing... There's no one doing rock these days at all, so I still love my rock and roll. Always, always did love that. And um, but, but I love playing at the country festivals, and, and I've done a lot of work with a lot of country artists, uh, Southbound, uh, for example, and, and um, we've mm -hmm. we've had some great success in in that in that area too. So it's definitely something moving forward that um, that, that so I want to do more. Tim, into. You, Tim, Tim, I mean, look, you you would agree as a as a marketing and an, as an A and R man, but also yeah. someone with a great marketing instinct. You would accept, surely, that if you can crack the code effectively in the sort of music you make with Shannon, mm. he would absolutely fit in with an Australian country market and possibly even overseas, yeah? Well, yeah, look, I think you know, Shannon's an interesting case study because obviously he doesn't sing country music per se, but he is a country boy. And I think the reason why Shannon can headline a country festival, so to speak, is because like James Johnston, like Lee Kernigan, Adam Brand, um, you know, these sort of acts, he relates to these people, you know, what what he's all about as a person, as a family man, as a man who actually lives on a farm, relates to um, uh, all those, you know, blue-collar values that, that those fans uh, relate to. So, yes... Does he sing country music specifically? No, but the same fan, he's got sort of the same fans who like those artists as well. So it just kind of makes sense that, you know, you can have a bill with, with Taylor Moss and South Band XO and Adam Brand and have Shannon on the bill and no one, no one thinks that's weird. It just 
kind of works. And Shannon, does, you know, hasn't had to change his music to uh, endear himself to those fans and, and, and we'll, we'll never have to. I mean, if he wants to make a country record one day, great, but um, well, we're making a rock record, so we're not going down that road at all, are we? <laughs> you, could, you could certainly hear Shannon doing a song like if I wasn't doing this, can't you? Like the oh, I love that song. I love that song. Mm. That's, uh, that's, I heard that song the other day and, if, and, and it was just like, wow, I wish I could have articulated that the way he did it because people go like, oh, so what would you, would you be doing if I wasn't doing this? I'd, I'd, and it's like I'd still be having an absolute blast on stage every Friday night, you know what I mean? Just like I am whether there's 2,000 people or 20, you know? Well, do you remember when I first met you, you, you used to say, look, we used to work all day on the farm and then me, Shiny, and Damien would jump in the van, yeah. drive four hours to play in a pub just for beer, yeah. then drive four hours back, have two hours sleep and get up and work on the farm. Yeah, yeah, it was amazing because we'd, 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 we'd yeah. take, get, get all our flannels and all the, you know, the dirty clothes off and covered in poop, you know, cow shit and sheep shit and stuff and then get showered and dressed up and jump into the van. As soon as we jumped in the van, it was like... Game face on, we were rock stars, you know, and it was such a great, was such a great time. But, but that's the fun, and I, I do say this to people too a lot. You don't have to, you know, if you if your goal for your music career, you know, if if you if you're not going to make it right to the top, which is probably you know, goodness knows a percent of a percent. That's not. You don't have to get there to to enjoy everything that then people are enjoying, you know, just you can sing to a handful of people around a fire, around a, a bonfire and get just the same excitement and enjoyment and, and, and our self-satisfaction out of it, I think. So I think, you know, people need to get back to basics a little bit and realise how much fun just just singing and performing instead of uh, pinning everything on, on where it's going to take them because it's going to take them to, to a place where they're just having the best time of their life and they may miss it while they're, while they're looking at what they can do next, you know what I mean, which is I, I always try and... Uh, provide that to people. Oh, Dicko, um, tell us, let us know who you who you're working with and where anyone can see them. Too, in case in case anyone watches this podcast. Ah, uh, well, <laughs> well, look, as I said, he, um, Taylor Moss um, is he's doing great. She's she's at the moment recording new songs with M Squared, Michael Payne, and Michael DiLorenzo. I've been doing oh, great um, work with her. Yeah, great. And. Um, and also, Matt Cornell's got a fantastic duet coming up with Adam Brand called right, Out. Finally. And, um, and it's taken to the heart of the, um, the, the Speedway drag racing Did we community. miss that, Tim? Did Lost he, one of their did, own. Did, what? You, did Dicko freeze this in? He did, but he came back. Yeah, can, yeah, can you do that again? Sorry, Mike. Okay. For us. Look, Taylor's just making, Taylor's writing some songs this week with um, M Squared, Michael Painter and Michael DiLorenzo. Yep. Some yep. great, we, we've been asking her, she does a lot of really great country pop, Taylor, but we've asked her to come up with a country pride song, the song that is 100% down the line country, and they've achieved that, and I'm very excited to be able to sort of put that out there, and we'll probably be releasing that in April. And I'm working with Matt Cornell. He's got a duet with Adam Brown coming up called Our Church. And that's um, fantastic. It's just been used at the funeral and the memorial for that guy who lost his life drag racing at uh, Willow Bank. And, um, and, um, and it's quite emotive. And that started to get a little viral activity. So Great. it's a powerful song. It's about men talking about stuff and opening up and being there for each other during adversity. Yep. And Mike Carr is another one of mine who's he's that. relocated down to Tasmania, has turned into a bit of a hermit, but he's still he's one of the most genius songwriters ah, I've ever worked. With. He's amazing. And const constantly sends me songs up that I go, where did this come from? And he's yeah. just a wonderful human being. So I think he's going to make an album this year, which will be, which I think we will all be really proud of. Mm -hmm. And yeah, look, at, at, and at the moment, I've got some other pop artists as well. But um, but in terms of country, yeah, just learning the ropes and finding my way, really, and trying to understand quite a nuanced market. I, I, I go with a pop act like Taylor down to Tamworth, and I realise that it's, it is dominated, that whole scene, by traditionalists yeah. who don't necessarily understand or welcome the commercial side of, of country music. 
Yeah, yeah. That's just something that I have to accept and deal with, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. As I'm sure Tim has, you know? Look, I would say that... Um, so I've d- seem to have a lawnmower going on behind me or something, so I'm just going to do the best I can while it's happening. Um, I, I think it comes down to if, if you connect with people, there's an audience there, and uh, while there are some certain challenges within the industry that... Uh, and you know that can be overcome if you know if you're the real deal. Um, just to just to you know you've been married. Both of you have had you know married for a long time. What do you think is the basis to a successful marriage, Dicko? Well, I think I can speak for both Rochelle and Mel when I say forgiveness. <laughs> Absolutely. It's kind of that's all. Really, it. that's it. Yeah, that's it. That's all there is to it. <laughs> No, look. I also, look. I've been with I've been with Mel thirty seven years now, and 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 you know it's funny. We laugh at the same things. You know, we you know we we are chalk and cheese in some ways, but there's such a lot of our life view that we share that we know that you know we we feel the same way about things. We we're really comfortable in each other's um, in each other's company. And um, and she's got a wicked sense of humour, and I think, and and look, I, I like Shannon. Have had to work in the record industry, which has been long hours, being absent for for extended periods of time. And I think both myself and Shannon have had to really rely on our wives to be strong and and to really keep our lives on track while we're out having fun doing the business that we do. You know, and yes, we bring we yes we bring the money in, and that's really important. But I think we also need to understand that you know that they get the shitty end of the stick sometimes when they're dealing with toddlers. No, oh, mate, I, I, absolutely. I, th- I, I classed Rosh for the first sort of ten years after the show. She was a single parent, just about. Because back in them days, we'd be I'd be on the road for like you'd go you'd leave home and be and for six weeks just around Australia, you know, and let alone you know two months trips over the sea overseas. Um, writing songs and, and things like that. So the, the women, they, they, they are both very similar in, in, in that respect with having to deal with a couple of larrikins and uh, also, um, you know, being so, so strong. And, and but it's great to see you in a great place now, mate. We're, we're loving it where we are. We're out of Sydney now, up in a little block as well. And and uh, having so much fun just, you know, building the place up and and, um, and you know, having veggie patches and chickens and all that sort of stuff. You know, it's right. funny. It's really funny. It's... Um... Shannon, Shannon and the kids came up to us in Mullaney and uh, we live on about just under two acres in a, down a country lane. And Shiny, Sh- Shannon's older brother, came as well with their kids, beautiful kids. But it was really funny because you, you think, well, there's the idol judge and the rock star and they're, they're there in Queensland. And the two, the two Noel brothers were down looking at the soil going, oh, how good's this soil? <laughs> Absolutely. No, it's a great spot you're at, mate, for sure. <laughs> Beautiful spot. But do you know what it is, though? I feel so I feel so ill-equipped to be in the country because all my all my neighbours, my male neighbours, have got big sheds full of ride on mowers, tractors, and power tools. <laughs> and I'm just hopeless. I've got like a set of Allen keys from IKEA, <laughs> and that's my experience. Yeah. Oh no, I'm hearing you, mate, because I've actually just got a shed delivered. Uh, a couple of days ago, so uh, we're getting to, we're getting right into that now. But uh, as John Williams said, all Australian boys need a shed. <laughs> so uh, we better we better get you sorted, mate. But uh, Ian Dicko Dixon, thank you so much for being uh, on the very first uh, idol chatting with Nosey. I really appreciate it, mate. You're a uh, dear friend of mine, have been ever since uh, the show. And, and um, let's catch up soon. We're not that far away anymore, so it'd be great to see you. Yeah, lo- love you, love you, guts, Nolsey. And yes, Tim, yeah. thanks for being, uh, without knowing it, my mentor and educator. Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, that, is a su- that is a surprise. That is a surprise. And I'll take that. It certainly is a compliment. Thank you, guys. No love worries, you to mate. Talk. Thanks, mate. Good on you to go. See you, buddy. Bye. So, guys, thanks very much for listening. Hope you enjoyed uh, the very first show. Please like and save this podcast uh, on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Uh, Give the show a rating. I'm told it helps. (laughs) And uh, it helps to show more people. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, Until next time, take it easy.